Hello, Hello, everyone, and welcome to all who are joining us this evening to learn more about endobronchial valves. I'm Stephanie Williams with the COPD Foundation, and I'll be your moderator this evening. Our time together will be spent with two pulmonologists, Dr. Byron Tomashaw and Dr. Kyle Hogarth. I know you're going to learn so much from listening to these two leaders in their field. We will also have the pleasure of hearing from Sherry, a patient who has had the endobronchial valve procedure herself. And I know you're going to be interested in her story too. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for a question and answer session. Um, and for you to be able to ask questions, we ask you to write your questions in the chat section of the control panel. So in order to do that, to make it easy for you, if you just move your mouse a little bit, you'll see the control panel become active in the bottom of your screen. And there's a chat box um, at the bottom and you'll be able to type your, your message into the chat field there. Um, and you may type, the, type your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll get to as many of them as we can at the end. Um, just a note, there are two FDA approved endobronchial valves in the United States and the COPD Foundation does not endorse either valve system. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Byron Tomashaw, practicing pulmonologist and professor of medicine at Columbia University Medical Center and the COPD Foundation's co-founder and chief medical officer. Dr. Tomashaw, the floor is yours. Oh, you're muted, I believe. How's that? There you are. Oh, good. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie. And thank you all for inviting me. And I'm glad you're all joining us today. It's my job over the next 15 minutes or so to give you a brief overview of COPD before we get into the valves issue itself. Uh, there are 16 million Americans who have been diagnosed with COPD and an equal number are felt to have the disease but are yet undiagnosed. For those of you folks on the phone who have COPD, you are not alone. As you can see from the map, there's not a town, there's not a city, there's not a country, there's not a, a state in the United States that doesn't have a significant number of people with COPD in it, uh, more in the southeastern uh, part of the country than other parts of the country. Next slide, please. The face of COPD is changing. It used to be uh, old male smokers or former smokers. Now more women have the disease than men. More young people have the disease than we thought. Indeed, many of us believe that COPD actually starts very early in life, not just as an older person. There's a lot of information that suggests that people in rural America are more susceptible, more likely to have the disease than people living in the cities. And there's a lot of evidence suggesting that COPD is a healthcare disparity issue. The lower the income, the more likely people have COPD. Next slide, please. It is a, clearly has a lot of impact on the health system. Many people are hospitalized. Many of them affect the quality of their life, as you guys know. And many of them are on more than one medication a day. But what we didn't recognize in the past, as important as smoking may be, is that some 25% of the people with COPD in this country never smoked at all. Next slide, please. GOLD is, uh, stands for the Global Initiative for Chronic Obstructive Lung Disease. It's probably been the, important, the most important source for COPD education and, and, de and, and development of plans uh, than anything else out there. GOLD defines COPD as a common, and it's really important to stress, often preventable and treatable disease that is characterized by persistent respiratory symptoms and airflow limitation. The most common symptoms, as most of you guys know, are shortness of breath, cough, and or sputum production. They tend to be, those symptoms tend to be underreported. COPD is often punctuated by periods of acute worsening, flares of the disease, which we call exacerbations. And like many other chronic diseases, COPD is associated with a number of other comorbid conditions uh, that may impact quality of life and indeed uh, quantity of life. Next slide, please. COPD continues to be diagnosed with a breathing test called spirometry, where you take a big deep breath in and blow really fast out. I'm sure most of you guys have had that uh, at the time of diagnosis. A normal person should be able to blow out 70, 80% of that breath in the first second. When you have obstruction, you can't blow all of it out. And indeed, a post bronchodilator obstruction is the key to diagnosis of the disease and helps to differentiate it, for example, from asthma 
where you may have obstruction to breathing, but that gets better with medications. However, it's worth stressing that you can see a significant bronchodilator response in both COPD and asthma. The difference is that in asthma, it tends to be completely reversible, while in COPD it is not. That doesn't mean it's not a treatable, treatable disease. Next slide, please. There are other ways of looking at the disease. There are x-rays, as you can see the x-ray on the left is a chest x-ray of a person with emphysema. And you can see how big those lungs are. Those are much bigger lungs than normal. They just don't work as well as they should. And on the right, you see a picture of a CAT scan, a computer x-ray that many of you probably have had. You can see all those black holes. Those are evidence of emphysematous change. Next slide, please. There are other breathing studies that oftentimes we'll do, other testing we'll oftentimes do when we do evaluations. There's a machine called a body plethysmography machine called a body box. Uh, it sort of looks like a, a space capsule. Uh, in the old days, I would have told you it looks like a telephone booth, but we don't have telephone booths anymore. Uh, it helps to define the presence of air trapping, the presence of emphysema. We often do six minute walks to define the need for oxygen while ambulating. And it's not unusual for us to suggest that you have an arterial blood gas done. That better defines the oxygen requirements, but also shows whether or not carbon dioxide uh, levels are high. Remember, the role of the lungs is to get the good air in, that's the oxygen, and get the bad air, bad air out, that's the carbon dioxide. If we were to find, for example, that the carbon dioxide level is climbing, uh, you may need some additional tests, a sleep study to see if there's a component of obstruction. Uh, and you might be suggested that you use a non-invasive device, uh, sort of like a CPAP device like we use for, uh, for sleep apnea that sometimes can help blow off that carbon dioxide. We often suggest, indeed I always suggest, people have alpha-1 testing looking for the genetic form of this disease. Because heart and lung often gets affected by similar things, sometimes it's important to do some cardiac evaluation. An echocardiogram that many of you guys probably have had uh, helps to define whether there's a cardiac issue and so it helps to show whether or not uh, pressure, blood pressure is higher in the lungs than they should be. And then there's a very fancy test, a cardiopulmonary exercise test that isn't done as often as regular stress testing, but gives you an idea of how the lung works under stress, not just the heart. Next slide, please. All COPD is not the same. We think of it broadly as being divided into those people with chronic bronchitis where the problem lies in the airways, the branches of the tree, if you will, and emphysema where the problem lies in the leaves of the tree, uh, where instead of nice clusters of grapes, uh, the lung sometimes looks like it's filled with balloons. The airway disease, the bronchitis, sometimes it's a little easier to treat with our inhaled regimen. That doesn't mean inhalers can't play a role with emphysema, but does stress that it can be sometimes more difficult to treat. Next slide, please. Emphysema is really important, and I think most of us believe that the presence of emphysema should be looked for in all patients with significant COPD. Now, 50% of patients with COPD don't have any significant emphysema, but that implies that 50% of them do. The presence of emphysema is a risk factor for exacerbations, those flares I talked about before, disease progression, the presence of lung cancer. Uh, emphysema is a, is, a, is a specific risk. And localized emphysema. Uh, localized emphysema can imply therapeutic implications and we're gonna be talking about that a little bit later. Next. It's important to understand that all COPD is not the same. And it's not just that some have bronchitis and some have emphysema. There are other forms. There are frequent exacerbators, people who, are, who get flares more often. And indeed, frequent exacerbators tend to stay frequent exacerbators and infrequent exacerbators tend to stay as infrequent exacerbators. There are eosinophilic exacerbators, people who have increased allergy type cells, eosinophils present in, the, in, their, in their lungs and their blood. There's the alpha-1, which is the genetic form of COPD. There are overlaps with COPD and other conditions, whether they're heart disease or diabetes or, uh, or sleep apnea. And then there are these overlap syndromes, COPD plus asthma, COPD plus pulmonary fibrosis, COPD with sleep apnea, COPD with bronchiectasis. The point I'm trying to stress is that all COPD is not the same, that we need to define specific therapies for the specific types of COPD. Just like we would never treat all cancers the same, we need to move away from treating all COPD the same. Next slide, please. 
gold has, uh, to its credit, has moved away from spirometry. They use spirometry to define the severity of the disease, but they use symptoms and exacerbations to better define the approach. That's their ABCD box. Next slide, please. The COPD Foundation has taken a similar approach, pushing the concept of what we call treatable traits. Those are traits, they're, 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 they're portions of things that we can specifically treat, uh, like symptoms, for example like exacerbations, for example, but there are more. There's oxygenation issues, there's emphysema, there's chronic bronchitis, there are comorbidities, and there are others. As we move into the future, it's going to be more and more about dealing with these treatable traits. This is, after all, as Gold has said, a treatable disease. Next slide, please. The mainstay of therapy for COPD are bronchodilators. Those are, are, are inhalers, if you will, medicines in inhaler form that helps you to widen your airways. They bronchodilate. And we have found that two bronchodilators together are often more effective than just one alone. That's different than asthma. So bronchodilators are the mainstay of therapy for COPD. In asthma, the mainstay of therapy are inhaled steroids. Now we do use inhaled steroid in COPD, but the primary role is in those people who have frequent exacerbations. Vaccinations are important, not just flu vaccines, but pneumonia va vaccines, pertussis, whooping cough vaccines, uh, shingles vaccine, and hopefully in the near future, uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Smoking cessation is obviously a critical issue for those who are, who are smoking or continue to smoke. And pulmonary rehabilitation is an unbelievably important uh, program. It's an exercise program, but it offers more than that. It offers instruction of breathing. It shows you that you're not alone. The foundation, along with others, are working very hard to develop virtual uh, pulmonary rehab programs, not just for the COVID era, but for when we finally get through to the end of the COVID era. There are medicines, refumilast, azithromycin, that we sometimes use in people who have recurrent bronchitis, recurrent flares, and that can be very effective. Oxygen can be very helpful. Indeed, for 50 years, we've known that people who meet criteria uh, and need oxygen, if they use oxygen, have significant improvements, not just in quality of life, but in survival. The only therapy that we've defined, clearly defined, that improves survival beyond oxygen is lung volume reduction surgery, interestingly enough. So we do have some options out there. I mentioned before the role of non-invasive ventilation if a carbon dioxide level is up or if there's a component of sleep apnea. That's a procedure that we're using more and more, not just in a hospital setting. And I wanna close by something that everyone should remember and that is that in COPD, the primary role for systemic steroids, for oral steroids, things like prednisone, for example, are really during that, that, uh, that exacerbation, not on a chronic basis. Next slide, please. Once you have someone on a regimen, it's really helpful to use tools to manage and follow symptoms. So for example, uh, the foundation along with others have developed action plans where you have green days, yellow days, red days, where you can outline where, what your approach should be. We use the MMRC, which is a breathlessness uh, criteria that you see on the slide. And we use the CAT, which is an eight questionnaire, which has not only questions about cough and shortness of breath and sputum development and chest tightness, but also fatigue, uh, a lack of confidence, sleep-related problems that can give you a really good gauge on how you're doing and something certainly which can help your doctors, your, your caregivers define what steps need to be taken. Next slide, please. For now over 12, 13 years, the foundation has been developing a pocket consultant guide. And over those years, we have provided over 800,000 of these to healthcare professionals around the country at no charge. We update them regularly. Indeed, the most recent update, this is hot off the presses, uh, uh, will be, uh, will be uh, printed out within the next month or so. And as you can see, the blue areas are treatable traits as we push forward with the concept of going after those treatable traits. And as you can see, what we stress is that in people with symptoms of COPD, but rare or not frequent exacerbations, the mainstay of therapy are those bronchodilators we talked about. While in those people who have more frequent exacerbations, it's the addition of the inhaled steroids to the bronchodilators that seems to play a potential role. 
And if that is still people are still continuing to struggle, we suggest that you move on to other options because there are always other options. You might consider having a CT scan, a pulmonary consult, oxygen evaluation, and those evaluations might lead you to decide that there is more of a bronchitic component that maybe these other medicines added to your inhalers would help. Maybe we will find a significant component to emphysema that might lead us to an evaluation of either lung volume reduction surgery or bronchoscopic lung volume reduction that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. Next slide, please. More recently, we have, we have redeveloped our app, which is free for, for, for patients or providers uh, by, by going to the App Store or Google Play and typing in COPD Pocket Consultant Guide. There are, as you can see on the slide, a patient track and a provider track. The provider track provides inhaler education. It provides all the available medicines, both in brand and generic form. It provides your therapy chart. It provides an access to the journal of the COPD Foundation, provides a lot of helpful information. The patient track is really interesting. Next slide, please. It includes, for example, the COPD action plan in an interactive format where you can put in on a daily basis, whether it's a green day, yellow day, or red day, and then the calendar that's on the on the app will highlight it, as you can see on the screen. So when you go in and see your physician, your provider, you'll be able to show them what your last month or two is like. Very helpful. Next slide, please. We have information about planning for your next visit with your doctor. Uh, also helpful. We have all those inhaler videos. Increasingly, I find that I, I teach people how to use a specific inhaler only to find that their, 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 uh, their insurance has switched them to a completely different medication where they may not know how to use the inhaler. These videos will help them through that. We also have a whole sequence of exercise videos that we're adding to all the time uh, and hopefully will be of help. Next slide, please. All of this is about increasing your, improving the commu communication between you and your healthcare professional, whether that's your doctor or the PA or your nurse. Uh, we need to find the right treatment for you. COPD is not all the same. And what tonight's webinar is about is showing you a specific therapy for specific types of emphysema, not just specific types of COPD. We can make a difference. When you understand COPD and how it's affecting you, how it's progressing, you can have the appropriate conversations with your doctor about what treatment options are right for you. Thank you again for inviting me. Dr. Thomas Shaw, thank you so much for all that information. That was a great overview of COPD, um, the way it progresses, the differences. That was just wonderful. And we appreciate your being here with us tonight. Thank you. We are also pleased tonight um, to be joined by D. Kyle Hogarth, MD, Professor of Medicine from the University of Chicago. He directs the Interventional Pulmonary Program there, as well as the Pulmonary Rehab Program. Dr. Hogarth was the first physician in Illinois to perform bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, or BLVR, as it's referred to, for severe emphysema. Um, in addition to his clinical and research work, he also runs a clinic devoted to alpha-1 and to trypsin deficiency, a genetic disease that causes emphysema and COPD. Dr. Hogarth is the past president of the Society for Advanced Bronchoscopy. And Dr. Hogarth, with that, I turn it over to you. There, all right, unmuted. Thanks so much. And I hope my slides are showing up. Yeah. So, um, okay, good. That was a fantastic uh, last lecture uh, for all patients. I actually, Dr. Thomas Shaw, I'm gonna make actually a couple of my fellows watch that as well too. It's a, um, it, and that is one of the most comprehensive overviews I've ever heard about how to take care of yourself as a patient. Um, if you follow those guidelines, you will see improvement in your breathing. The problem that we run into though, is that for some people, they've, they've reached the limits of what we can get from all of the things that you just heard about. And they may not necessarily be a candidate for lung transplant for a number of reasons, but that doesn't mean they have to be sitting there and continuing to suffer. And so that's where hopefully this, uh, what I'm gonna talk about might be an option for some patients. If I can get slides to advance, let's see. <laughs> Give me one second here. Okay, well, as we've already talked about, we know emphysema 
severe form of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It is progressive. It is due to the destruction of the lung tissue. And as Dr. Tomashaw showed, uh, the, you know, the air sacs essentially lose their elasticity. People start to trap gas and they get more and more short of breath. It is one of the top 10 causes of death within the US and around the world. But long before that, it robs you of your life and gives you a low quality of being able to do things and people suffer. You know, when, when you can't breathe, nothing else matters. And we want to be able to have people be more comfortable. That air trapping and hyperinflation is one of the key components of emphysema. In a healthy lung tissue, it's very elastic. You stretch the lungs out, they snap back in and they empty. Breathing's easy. The lung expands and contracts normally. It takes very little effort to take a breath. But in along with emphysema, the tissue destruction reduces that elasticity and the gas exchange. The air gets trapped in the diseased portions of the lung, increasing the volume and putting pressure on the diaphragm, making people even more breathless. For those that are watching tonight, if you're family members of a loved one with emphysema and COPD, if you want to know what it feels like to breathe with emphysema, I would like the healthy people on without lung disease, take a deep breath, as deep as you can go. And now for the next 10 minutes, you don't get to exhale, you just breathe there at the maximum amount of your lungs and walk around and try to do things. And obviously we're exaggerating it, but that's what it can feel like. And that's what we're trying to fix. So the progression for COPD patients and emphysema patients is that hyperinflation that leads to decreased activity. If you get short of breath walking around, you do less, but that then makes you out of shape. You reduce your exercise capacity. You increase your breathlessness further. That, of course, becomes the spiral down of even less activity, more deconditioning. All of these things, besides, that's awful enough, but they ultimately do increase your risk for mortality and robbing you also of quality of life along the way. So the idea of valves, which were designated a breakthrough technology for severe emphysema patients, and this is a picture of a catheter deploying a valve inside the airways. These are tiny implantable devices. Um, they are... I guess I'll say roughly the, the size of a pea, maybe a little bit larger than the size of a pea. Um, what's very nice is that they can give benefits similar to the surgery that does lung volume reduction, but with no cutting and there's no incisions. We go through your mouth and you are asleep for it. There is a very precise patient selection. So people with emphysema and COPD are potentially candidates for this procedure. The workup is then done to determine if you are a pet, uh, someone who would benefit. Thankfully, a lot of the research that got done also told us exactly who will not benefit from these procedures. Though unfortunate, it does help us to avoid an unnecessary invasive procedure if it can't help you. This has been proven in clinical trials. It is part of guidelines, and they are fully removable as well, which is an additional benefit. As we all know, large studies get done. There's a wide range of effects. Every person is individually different. You might be the most perfect patient, but if you somehow don't have the response that we all were expecting and hoping for, we're able to undo this. And so that's another nice benefit. So where do we consider these? Well, obviously all patients with COPD, the medical management that was already uh, reviewed, pulmonary rehabilitation, if you're not moving, you need to be moving. But long before we're talking about large surgeries and things like transplant is where endobronchial valves get essentially involved. So people with early stages of disease, valves are not a role here. But for more advanced disease or for people that are still very breathless with all of the standard of care, then it's time for the new standard of care. And we add on endobronchial valves if you're a candidate. So here's how they work. I'm going to play a video here. This video is showing you a very large hyperexpanded lung. We're going to zoom in on the bronchoscope. This is the catheter that's going down into the lung. And you'll zoom in and there's the scope. And there's this little catheter. And this is one of the branches that we needed to plug up. And there's a valve that essentially is going to let air out, but let no air back in. What this is going to do is deflate that region of the lung. That lung is hyperexpanded, trapping all this gas. See the airway shrinking? There's no air going in there. So that whole part of the lung is going to shrink down. And what that does is that shrinks down. You'll see the remaining parts start to expand and do more work. The diaphragm is able to come up more. People are able to breathe easier because the part of the lung that was doing very little work, instead of being cut out, has been shrunk down and out of the way. Those severe parts of emphysema are doubly bad because not only do they not work, they are compressing the healthier regions of your lung. 
So how do we figure out if you're a candidate? Well, you have to have reduced lung function. You have to have what's called a high residual volume. When Dr. Thomas Shaw was talking about the pulmonary function testing. You have to be someone who is hyperinflated. All of COPD and emphysema is different for everybody. So you may be very short of breath, but that does not mean you have a high residual volume. The pulmonary function testing is how we're going to determine if you meet the pulmonary criteria. We also have to have emphysema. You also have to, of course, be stable. You need to be able to safely undergo a procedure. But more importantly, as well as the CT scan, a specialized CAT scan done at the centers that do this procedure to evaluate if your lung structure is suitable for the procedure. Again, you may have very bad lungs. That's not the you know open for debate, but you have to have a specific target for us to put these valves in. And then of course, if you do, you get the valve procedure. Why do we, what's the cri uh, criteria? So the easiest way to think about this. So here's an example of the left lung. And there's two lobes in the left lung and the upper and the lower lobe have a, what's called a fissure between them. And think of it as a wall. These two parts of the lung do not communicate with each other in a normal situation. So that if I put valves in one part or the other part, I am then uh, gonna let the air out of that spot and then the other part will expand. But for some people, the fissure has developed holes and it has bunches of holes. So then what happens is I'm, as I'm busy trying to shut one lobe down and let the air out, it's refilling from a back door. So I'm busy trying to shut the front door to your part of the lung and you're getting refilled from the back door, which means you would never collapse. So there are some people obviously who based on their CAT scan and other testing that we can do, will unfortunately have this collateral ventilation where the valves will not work. So we obviously won't place them in you if they have zero chance of helping you. And that's unfortunate. The good news is there are several things under investigation to try to help people who are in this situation, none of which are FDA approved at the moment, but lots of research and lots of potential options coming down the road for patients. The valve benefits, so if you go for this, if you are a candidate, what could you expect? So we get the successful occlusion of that lobe. Therefore, we get the reduced gas trapping like we saw in the video. That does and has been proven to increase your lung function, reduced sense of breathlessness, and therefore an improved quality of life and an improved ability to exercise. That obviously leads to an improved health status. So we saw earlier how the disease kind of takes us down this sort of stairs and the snowball effect. Thankfully, the benefit from the valves gives us a snowball effect in the opposite direction. You're then able to do even more at your pulmonary rehab and get yourself even into better shape. The patient reported benefits. So in the study, it were people who got no valves and those who got valves. Less breathlessness across multiple different measurements that we use, some of which Dr. Thomas Shaw went through. Those, those scales, those things that you can report your symptoms. Greater ability to do activities such as bathe yourself, do the household chores, go for walks. Fewer limitations in your ability to do activities or even return to work. It's just a generalized feeling of more energy and feeling then with that more confidence to leave your homes. Again, I mean, not in the COVID era, but this was done pre-COVID. And the thing about this, um, this ability to do activities and so forth, this obviously begets even more success because you get yourself into greater physical shape. That feeling of energy, one of the other things that COPD and emphysema rob you, the lungs become so inefficient because of the gas trapping, that the energy your body spends, I'm right now, I have normal lungs, I'm breathing, and my body spends very little energy to power my lungs. But for those with emphysema and COPD, it takes a lot more energy to power your lungs. So if you do feel very exhausted by the day, end of the day, you are. You've done way more work just to breathe than anyone else. So let's break down some myths. Vows are new. Actually, no, they're just newly approved. There's been over 20,000 patients worldwide that have had valves. It's included in the gold, the gold guidelines that you had heard about and national guidance documents. We have had, these have been under investigation for a period, multiple studies to ultimately bring them to FDA approval. Myth number two, valve isn't in covered by insurance. Most patients who qualify the procedure are able to secure insurance coverage for this patient, for their treatment. You're clearly gonna to have to talk about that individually with your physician and it'll depend on your insurance. But I will tell you at my own center, we have had only three patients who did not qualify for their insurance with their insurance, that particular brand of insurance. Um, I spent time working with them and actually as of two weeks ago, they now approve it as well. So 
I, the, the three people that I had not been able to perform upon, um, that is no longer true for my own uh, practice. So now I think we're gonna move on to an individual patient if I'm reading our slides correctly. Um, so I, I'm gonna go back so I don't, right, Stephanie, I don't wanna steal her thunder, uh, but That's thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much everybody for your time. I will tell you the, the valves, um, uh, you can obviously get more information in particular, um, you want to find someone who's obviously had experience placing them um, and uh, uh, get the evaluation done. If your doctor doesn't place them, do not let them tell you you are not a candidate until you've been seen by someone who places the vows. If that person says you're not a candidate, unfortunately, it does mean that you are not a candidate if they've had the, you know, that you've had the appropriate testing. And with that, I will be quiet. I'm going to hit the stop share button. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hogarth. That was uh, fascinating. That was a great presentation. I feel like I've learned a lot tonight and I hope our audience has as well. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. I actually did two patients today. Well, that is wonderful. That's wonderful for you and for them both. That's great. Um, so at this time, I'm going to try and pull my slides up quickly um, so that we can meet our patient. If it will work for me. Of course not. <laughs> if I can just advance quickly, maybe. No, it's not going to load like that either. Um, Get there. Almost there, I think. So um, at this time, I would like to introduce to you all our patient representative. This is Sherry. Sherry is a retired RN who suffered with emphysema and had the endobronchial valve procedure in the spring of 2019. She lives in Oregon and is the proud grandma of 13 and is here tonight to talk about her experience having the valve procedure. So Sherry, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can see you a little bit bigger on the screen here with us. There you are. Um, and I'm so glad that you're here. Um, and if I may, I would love to ask you a few questions um, so that you can answer those for our audience tonight. Certainly. Could you tell us a little bit about what your life was like before COPD? Before COPD, um, which was actually lightly diagnosed when I was in my 20s, like late 20s around then. I was a heavy smoker, um, not really aggressively treated, but I lived a busy active life. I had four kids that were very close in age, um, involved in all kinds of activities. Go, go, go. Um, in about 2010, and I did quit smoking. And um, that was when things actually, it started to get worse. Um, as far as my breathing, I, I'd gotten short of breath. I had chronic bronchitis. I had the smoker cough. <clears throat> um, so it started with, you know, having to call an ambulance one day because yeah, I think it was, it was probably the, the gas exchange. Um, I couldn't, if I was breathing, but it wasn't working. It wasn't doing what it needed to do. And I felt very sleepy. And being an RN, I knew that probably wasn't a good sign. Um, and called an ambulance. And that was the first of many, many rides to the hospital. Right. So it sounds like, you know, you had a little bit of knowledge about what was happening to you um, and right. what was happening in your lungs. And you knew that those weren't good signals that your body was giving you. And I, my activity level started to, it reached a point where things that I enjoyed, I was always very independent, very able to do projects around the house, take care of my home. And it reached a point where I was be becoming more and more dependent on other people to do those things. Thank you for sharing that. I know that's, that's not an easy thing to share sometimes about, you know, losing that independence, but thank you for being open with us about that. Um, so how did you learn about the endobronchial valve option? Where did you learn that? So I had been participating in pulmonary rehab and I had to take a medical retirement um, as a nurse in 2017. I, I just couldn't, I couldn't work anymore. It was taking me two days to get ready to I'd have to shower and get things ready the night before. And it, it was getting harder and harder every morning to be able to get up and get dressed and get out the door. Um, and it, it was just 
And uh, my job involved a lot of talking on the phone and with face to face with patients. And um, it was taking my breath away. I couldn't talk in whole, full sentences. Um, so I took the medical retirement in 2017, was not doing good. Um, ended up on oxygen. I'd been on oxygen at night for a while, ended up on it 24 seven. Um, went in for a pulmonary rehab appointment and one of the RTs asked, she was very excited. She said, hey, have you ever heard of this? Have you heard about this? I, and I hadn't. And I, yeah, and she told me what a little bit she knew. She had already printed off information off the internet for me. And so I had an appointment with my pulmonologist later that, that day. So I took that stuff, went to a restaurant and I'm texting my kids. My daughters are going crazy. Everybody's Googling it. And we decided, because I was already in process to go to, up to the University of Washington for lung volume reduction surgery, which I was not happy about. And transplant lists had been discussed and you know recommended, and I I wasn't going to do it. But you know the surgery was being um, processed, and then I heard about this, and um, my pulmonologist said, and he's doing them now here locally. Um, he said, "Is this something you would consider?" And I was like, "Absolutely." You know, and so he uh, contacted a hospital in California, Northern California. Um, it was about an eight hour drive for us. <laughs> but at that point we would have done, we were willing to do whatever it took. And um, it was just, um, so yeah, that's that's how I heard about it. That's how the process was. Yeah. Well, I have another question for you. What was your experience like having the procedure done what what was that whole experience like for you it was relatively simple you know it, it was a bronchoscopy it wasn't surgical there was a little bit of chest wall pain afterwards a little bit of a sore throat but nothing you know i've been through a whole lot worse and i think the staff for one thing were phenomenal um and Nurses aren't always the easiest patients, so <laughs> it was, but they were, they were amazing and um, so invested in, in what they were doing. Um, and I knew, we knew going in, now keep in mind, we're driving, you know, about eight hours with a, we had a young, an eight-year-old with us, knowing that once we got there, I might not be able to get them if I had CV. It was in, in the collateral ventilation. So we, we knew that that was a possibility. Um, I woke up. I said, did I get my valves? They said, yes, you did. I said, good. I went back to sleep. <laughs> and then that, later that day, when they were putting me up in my room, I noticed some pretty, and people with COPD can relate to these things. One, I took a, a deep breath and it just happened. It, it, it was just like, oh my gosh. Um, and the band, the, the diaphragm band, that I had had for so long, it always felt like I had a belt tied around underneath my ribs and that pressure there, that was gone. I mean, not like, I could, not completely gone because I still have my right side that was affected, but that was gone and I ate a full meal and I had not eaten like a full plate of food for a, a few years at least because there just wasn't room for it. So those were immediate so, things that I noticed right away. So what's different for you now? This has been, you know, you're a little bit out from your procedure now. So how is life different for you now? Well, I I still get help whenever anybody will help me because I choose <laughs> I choose my activities. But, you know, I still have COPD. I do get shorter breath at times with increased activity. So if I'm planning to go do something fun, I'm not going to spend my energy vacuuming. <laughs> I'll get someone else to do that, right? But um, I don't, I no longer worry about, am I going to have a, an episode when I'm out in public? Am I, do I need my portable oxygen? Um, I, mean, I, I don't sit down and say, okay, can I do, which, can I go to this store today? I don't have to budget life anymore. I can just get up and go and do what I want to do. Um, so that is wonderful. Huh? That is wonderful. I'm so happy for you. I went from sitting on the couch on oxygen, watching my 
especially my little grandkids, to being able to get up and dance with them and play with them and go swimming with them. Um, and one piece of my post procedure that my uh, uh, that Meg likes me to share is I had the valves on a Tuesday and that Saturday after I discharged from the hospital, we were, we took, I went swimming with the dolphins. <laughs> it was not approved by my respiratory therapist. Um, they were not recommended, but um, we took a little side trip towards the uh, Vallejo, California, and I uh, went took my granddaughter swimming with the dolphins. I am just, I'm so thrilled for you. I'm so thrilled for you that you've had such a success with the procedure. I'm thrilled that you've been able to make memories uh, with your family. I think that is just fabulous. And I thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Don't go anywhere though, because I have a feeling during the Q&A session, you may have some questions coming to awesome. you. So yeah. don't go anywhere. All right, thank Stay you. Tuned. Okay, <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, so just quickly, um, I know that we are uh, rapidly approaching the top of the hour. Um, and so I would love to move us into the question and answer session. So again, if you haven't yet asked a question, you can feel free to do that now. You can just move your mouse a little bit. The control, bo uh, control bar will appear and you can um, type your question into the Q&A at the bottom of the panel. So um, I do have a few questions for you all. And so what I will do is so that we're not talking over each other and, you know, stumbling over, st stumbling over each other, I will um, let you know who I'm asking the question to. So Dr. Thomas Shaw, Dr. Hogarth, or Sherry, I'll let you know who the question is coming to, and then I'll ask the question. Um, and so the first question is... Um, it's going to be for Dr. Thomas Shaw. Um, I don't know if the kind of emphysema I have would be treated with valves or not, but I have heard good things about pulmonary rehab. Should I ask my doctor about signing me up for rehab? Would that be a good thing for me to do just in case I can have the procedure? Uh, pulmonary rehab is, is a critical part of everyone's care with COPD. And uh, as I'm sure Kyle will say as well, uh, oftentimes, in order to have a procedure, whether it's lung volume reduction surgery or the valve, you need to undergo a pulmonary rehabilitation program. You know, right. pulmonary rehab does a lot of stuff. Uh, the uh, I, we, Columbia, where I work at, uh, was one of the 17 centers in the National Emphysema Treatment Trial back when, when, the, when the data was defined of its role. Uh, and there was a significant percentage of people who were potential candidates who after they went through the pulmonary rehab had improved enough that they never even ended up having to have the surgery. So pulmonary rehab is really important. One of the things which is so aggravating to all of us is that for a procedure that is very inexpensive, that has really no risk and does pretty much everything you could want it to do, only two to 3% of all patients with COPD in this country actually undergo pulmonary rehab. That's simply not acceptable and something we have to change. I agree, Dr. Thomas Shaw. I think it's one of the best kept secrets in the worst way. I think people should yeah. really take advantage of it if they have that in their area. And like you said yeah, earlier, virtual pulmonary rehab. rehab is up and coming. So take advantage of it. I'm I sorry, Dr. In, you know, the one thing I always say about rehab is, so every medication that patients might be on, are, you know, they're great, but everybody's responses are different. So not every medication is a home run for every patient. I've never sent anyone to pulmonary rehab who went and came back and said that was a waste of time. Yes, I agree with that completely. I have a soft place in my heart for pulmonary rehab anyway. Um, so Dr. Hogarth, this question will be for you. Um, okay. the, um, the question is how long must someone have stopped smoking before the valve procedure can be done? The minimum is gonna be a month and it has everything to do with the fact that um, because this is a procedure that involves general anesthesia and a three day hospital stay afterwards, um, there is data that active smokers who undergo procedures have a higher risk for complications, regardless of what the procedure is. So from a perspective of safety, um, you have to absolutely quit. But I guess what I would also say is before you're about to undergo an invasive procedure that has benefit but carries some risk, um, you're trying to do this so you can breathe better. 
I think quitting smoking seems like the first logical step that's involved in actually getting your health affairs in, in order. Um, and so we won't do it for your own safety, but honestly, I won't do it as well because we need to get your priorities straight. Thank you very much. Quitting smoking, tough thing to do, but one of the oh, most beneficial definitely. things. We'll never, ever, ever claim that it's easy. Under no circumstances do I ever make light of the challenge. But if you're going to have a surgery and a procedure on your chest, then you need to quit smoking. And actually for, for safety reasons. Thank you. Yes. Very true. Um, Dr. Thomas Shaw, this question, uh, I'll direct it to you. My uncle had the lung volume reduction surgery years ago and did well after he recovered from the surgery. My emphysema is not too bad right now, but when should I talk to my doctor or when should my doctor and I have a conversation about my next level of care? I, I'll come back to the concept of treatable traits that we talked about before, Seth. Uh, you know, it depends upon what your symptoms are. I mean, if you're doing fine and you're living your life and you're doing the things you want to do, I think that's really important. You know, you know, you know, pulmonary rehab, exercise programs, taking your medicines. If you're doing well, if, you're, if your CAT score that we talked about before isn't bad, uh, just keep your doctor in the loop. And, you know, if it looks like things are getting worse, we can reevaluate our options. Uh, the whole idea here is to keep the quality of life going. And, you know, the less that you have to deal with people like me and Kyle, the better off you are. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Hogarth, this question will be for you. We're getting several questions um, in the Q&A uh, about what happens to that portion of the lung once it has collapsed. Yeah, nothing. It just stops taking up space. Um, it's, it's, if we took the valves out, it will re-expand back up to the, uh, abnormal lung that it was. Great. Thank you. The lung is, the lung is like a big balloon. And if we let all the air out, it just collapsed down to a floppy little nothing, but we can expand it obviously back up. Thank you very much. Um, Sherry, this question is for you. Um, the asker wants to know how severe your COPD is, how, how severe your COPD was. Do you feel it was severe COPD? Um, going into it, my FEV1 was less than 29%. I was on oxygen, but could would still get short of breath, like breathless if I turned over in bed at night or trying to get up in the morning, um, walking to and from the bathroom. I stayed on oxygen and you know would, would be out of breath. Um, the way my house is set up, I was able to wall walk or tripod through from my bedroom into my living room. It's an open floor plan into the kitchen. So I was, um, I couldn't carry on a conversation without having you know, like maybe three words or two words, um, would fall asleep frequently. Um, it was bad. I basically, it, it was very depressing. It was very frustrating. Um, like I said, I had to I had to resign from a job that I absolutely loved, and um, yeah. you know I, I tried to fix something to eat. I tried to maintain a healthy diet, but by the time I would get up and fix something to eat, I was too tired to eat it. Thank you for that. I think that probably answers um, several people had asked that question, wanting to know kind of at what stage you you felt you were. Um, the next question. Um, I'll ask this one to Dr. Thomas Shaw. I am on oxygen and have been told that my damage to my lungs is in the upper lobes. Um, it, does it make sense that I could still have this procedure done? Um, I've lost I've lost the question in the feed. It just jumped on me, but that's that's the gist of it. Um, so, on oxygen. So yeah, so uh, as Dr. Hogarth said, uh, there is an evaluation process that you have to go through. All COPD is not the same. All COPD patients don't have emphysema or bad enough emphysema to do anything about. And not all patients with emphysema are candidates for either the surgery or the, uh, or the valve placement. It's not for everyone. But in those people who are candidates, as you've just heard, uh, these procedures can sometimes have remarkable benefits. 
Uh, obviously, it would be best not to have the COPD in the first place. Obviously, it's best for you to do your exercise and your pulmonary rehab and take your medications. This is a preventable and treatable disease. But if you need it and you meet the criteria, you can have some remarkable results. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Hogarth, this question is for you. My pulmonologist says I have to do six minute walk for 250 meters to even qualify for her to install the valves. I see that nowhere in the criteria. I need valves to do a better job of walking and exerting myself. Am I out of luck? Rehabs are closed and virtual is just not the same um, as effect or as effective. Oh, it's a, it is a great question. Um, in the various studies, there were limits. Um, they wanted, uh, when you're trying to obviously prove a benefit of a device, they needed people that had some degree of mobility um, to be able to then show that there was an improvement. In other words, if you had been somebody who couldn't walk more than five feet before you had to stop and catch your breath, the problem was is that person would have been considered so advanced of disease, they wouldn't let you enroll in the study. Now, whether you can help that person or not with these valves still has not been studied. I will tell you, in our own practice, my, my, myself personally and my partner as well, um, we want you to have at least been in a pulmonary rehab program within the last two years and that some acknowledgement of the effort you're making to be exertional. Um, if you basically never get out of your chair, except possibly to get up to go to the restroom and that's it, the valves have a really hard time providing a benefit because they will reshape the lungs, but you are so profoundly deconditioned. But that being said, we make individual exceptions. So I think what I would suggest that patients should essentially have a further discussion with their doctor, almost negotiate if you will. And at the same time, they should also consider a second opinion. There are many people who put these valves in. Um, uh, some obviously in some regions, it may only be one person, um, but they should obviously, uh, uh, get a second opinion. Thank you. Um, Dr. Tomashaw, this question is for you. This is a, a general COPD question. What is the best way to deal with, avoid, or not have flare-ups with COPD? So, I mean, you know, we live in a COVID world, uh, and many of, the, uh, many of the things we're doing for COVID protection would be of help here. So getting your flu shot, uh, washing your hands, uh, keeping your hands clean, avoid exposures to people who might be un unwell. All of those things are possible. Uh, but having said that, you know, flares, exacerbations happen. As I mentioned earlier, people who are predisposed to it seem to be beget them more often than those who are not predisposed to it. The most important issue, besides trying to prevent them, as I with the things I mentioned, is to talk to your healthcare provider, talk to your healthcare professional about what they should do at the first sign of an infection, what they should do at the first sign of a flare. Because if you can do that and start that therapy up soon enough, uh, you can oftentimes halt them so that you don't remain sick for weeks, if not months thereafter. So the more aggressive the approach, oftentimes, the better we are. Part of the problem with this disease is there's not only been, a, there's a lot of nihilism about, well, there's nothing we can really do. You just got to suck it up and live with it. That's really not true. There's a lot that we can do. Thank you so much. Um, Sherry, this question is for you. Um, the question is, um, how much lung function did you gain after your surgery? Um, recognizing that you did one, you did one lung. Yes. So <clears throat> I went up to 43% FEV one from less than 29. So I That's almost, good. almost went up two more, two more percents than I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have qualified for the valves. Isn't the, the cutoff is 45% at the top upper level. So, um, and the other tests were good too. I just don't happen to have those in my head. Um, no, I think that's helpful. I think that's a number that a lot of our viewers will probably recognize, you know, that the FEV1, they'll, they'll key in on that and they know what that means for them. I think when most people refer to um, what their lung function is, they're referring to the FEV1. 
Um, Dr. Hogarth. Ste Stephanie, it, it's really, really important to understand that although we use the FEV1 and it's an important gauge, and it certainly, as you've heard, uh, one of the criteria we use to determine who may be candidates or who need to be evaluated for lung volume reduction surgery or for the valve, it's important to stress that, that the FEV1, you know, you can have two people with the same FEV1 uh, with, with different symptoms, different limitations. Uh, you need to look at the person, uh, not just the FEV1. Uh, and I think that's really important to understand. That is important. Thank you. That is true. I mean, you know, as a respiratory therapist, I know that if I have 10 people in the room with COPD, it's going to look 10 different ways. So um, and FEV1s don't necessarily um, translate evenly across all 10 of those. Um, so that is that is good a good reminder. Um Let's see, Dr. Hogarth, um, can you explain a little bit about what happens um, post procedure? Um, like how long does how long do you stay um, in recovery? Do you have a hospital stay afterwards? Um, and what kind of um, issues might come up sure. that people would need to be aware of? So one of the consequences of valves um, is that as we are causing the collapse of the targeted area. The healthy part expands, that's the goal. The healthier part though always has some emphysema in it, just a lot less than the other. And as that part expands and takes up space, there is always the risk that one of those emphysema bubbles in the healthier region will burst. And that would lead to a collapse of the good part of the lung and essentially then, um, and that's an emergency. And that does obviously occur with these devices and they're most likely to occur within the first three days, which is why we keep people in the hospital for three days so that we can monitor for that complication and deal with it if it does occur. Um, during those three days, um, you'll at first, you may need slightly more oxygen because as that part of the lung has lost air, it's still sending some amount of blood flow to pick up oxygen. And obviously there's no oxygen to pick up. Your body makes changes over a few days, so that becomes a non-issue. You go back to your baseline level of oxygen, typically. Um, this will not get you off oxygen. If you are on oxygen, you will still be on oxygen. Um, the three days, sometimes there'll be some chest discomfort um, as part of the lung is shrinking and the other part's expanding and the ribs are changing shape and the diaphragm is coming up. Various ligaments and, uh, are being pulled upon and there can be some chest discomfort. It's usually something that can be handled with, you know, ibuprofen and, and heat and things like that. Um, but that's, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think, you know, a lot of people are asking about, you know, the risks and uh, they're concerned about that as, as they should be. So I think your answer, um, you know, helped them a lot in being able to process this information even more fully. Um, I do need to ask another question, Dr. Hogarth. Um, if something were to happen um, in the lung and the device needed to be removed, is that something that can happen? Um, well, very much so. Um, they, are, they are easy to place, they are easy to remove. Um, they are designed to stay in forever, but getting them out is not difficult at all. Um, it's, a, it's another procedure. We gotta go back in with the bronchoscope. But you kind of saw that video that showed, you know, the placement of it. That valve is just sitting there. We go and grab it with forceps and pull it out. So I think, again, that's one of the things that we like about the valves um, in our uh, practice is that, again, everybody's response is different. Um, and if you are somebody who did not get the outcomes that we had all expected and hoped for, and then in some cases you say, look, I feel worse no matter what the numbers may say, no matter what scans may say, you, the patient say, this did not help me, I feel worse. Now that's not a common thing, but if this was a permanent procedure, then there would have been nothing I could do. But thank goodness, what I can do is go back in and take them out. That will return you back to where you were, which I know wasn't acceptable, but if I've made you feel worse, then that's definitely not acceptable. I want you back to where you used to be. Right. Right, exactly. Don't want to, you know, that first thing, do, do no harm, right? Exactly. We're not going not gonna to leave somebody worse than we found them um, intentionally. So that's... There's very few things in medicine that I can put in that I can then take back out. Um, and this is thankfully one of them. Right. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. Um, I am going to go back to sharing my screen quickly. Um, because I think that is all the time that we have for this evening. I would first like to thank all of our presenters tonight, Dr. Tomashaw, Dr. Hogarth, and Sherry. Thank you all for being here and for sharing with us a little bit more about endobronchial valves, a little bit more about COPD, and um, some treatment of, treatments that are available to us. We would also like to thank Pulmonics for bringing us this great information to the community. I know that there's been a need for this discussion for a long time, so a big thank you there. And also a thank you to everyone who has attended this evening. We hope you found the presentations informative. And to continue the conversation, you're welcome to join us at www.copdfoundation.org, where there's an online community of patients and caregivers, as well as healthcare professionals engaging in conversations about this and other important topics related to COPD. Thank you again for this evening. Stay well.